Ladies and gentlemen, welcome very warmly to the Lowy Institute. My name is Michael Fullylove. I'm Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. And I'd like to welcome all of you here today, um, but especially uh, our lecturer today in, our, in the Distinguished Speaker Series, the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, the Honourable Peter O'Neill. I must say I'm pleased to see such a terrific audience here, including from our corporate partners and supporters, for what will be a very interesting discussion of matters of import in our region. We are very privileged indeed to welcome the PM to the Lowy Institute and we're pleased also to welcome members of his delegation, including my friend the Honourable Charles Abel MP, a fellow product of the Sunshine Coast, sort of, um, the Minister for Planning, the Honourable Robert Sandan Ganim MP and the Honourable Geoffrey Comel MP. I would also like to acknowledge our very good friend the PNG High Commissioner, Charles Lapani, who has been a strong supporter of the Institute for many years, as well as the PNG Consul General in Sydney. Ladies and gentlemen, we at the Institute take a strong interest in the political, economic, development and social challenges facing Papua New Guinea, Australia's closest neighbour. We have a strong and innovative Melanesia program led by my colleague Jenny Hayward-Jones, whom I'll call on later. The program published research just last week, for, for example, by Danielle Cave on the ICT revolution underway in the Pacific and PNG. It was called Digital Islands and it's available on the Lowy Institute website. And it's very interesting talking about all the positive implications of digital technologies in the Pacific enabled by the spread of mobile phones. Uh, Alex Oliver, another colleague of mine here, undertook interviews recently with rising PNG leaders about their careers and their aspirations and their ambitions as part of our leadership mapping project. Uh, last month, the Lowy Institute, as we were just telling the PM, hosted our annual New Voices event, which we've run for seven or eight years here in Australia. For the first time, we ran it offshore and we decided to do it in Port Moresby and it provided a platform for over 120 of PNG's future leaders in the private sector, government and civil society. And it was very inspiring to have all these young people talking about the direction of the national economy, how the popularity of social media was shaping policy choices. And there was one very strong message out of the New Voices Conference which was very interesting. And that was that PNG's geostrategic focus is shifting in part to Asia. And that brings me to the subject of the Asian century, which, is also, which will also be the subject of the Prime Minister's address today. We were honoured to have another Prime Minister, Prime Minister Julia Gillard, launch the, Australian, in the Australia in the Asian Century white paper in this very room uh, just three or four weeks ago. Let me say, as Australia's leading think tank, we at the Lowy Institute certainly feel the ripples of the Asian century. We know that it's upon us. Every report we issue, every event we host is touched in some way by Australia's interactions with Asia, the region in which so many of our challenges and opportunities lie. All of our research is marked by Asia's rise. The polarity of the world has shifted and the world senses it, and we certainly know it here at Bly Street. And that is why we are so pleased that the Prime Minister of our nearest neighbour has also chosen to speak to the Lowy Institute about the opportunities offered by the Asian century. The Honourable Peter O'Neill was sworn in as the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea following the July national elections, having served as Prime Minister since August of last year. He is the leader of the People's National Congress Party and represents a Southern Highlands constituency. Um, Prime Minister, I am personally delighted to welcome you to the Institute and we all look forward very much to your views on the challenges and opportunities that PNG sees in the Asian century. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Michael, for that uh, lovely introduction. And once again, I want to be uh, I'm very grateful that the Lowy Institute for including me in your uh, distinguished uh, series of speakers on the topic of Papua New Guinea in the Asian century. I want to commend the, uh, the interest of the Lowy Institute uh, that the uh, Lowy Institute shows in my country. I know at times uh, you are critical and you have expressed some robust uh, views on Australia's uh, aid program 
and other aspects of relationship with Papua New Guinea, as well as performance in some of those key areas. I certainly have no problem with that. Sometimes we need and we need to encourage and help facilitate, facilitate a robust and constructive scrutiny and debate on aid and other areas of development in my country. But before I address uh, you today uh, on, the, on the topic that you have asked me to speak, I just want to make a few observations on the relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea. I can say without hesitation that our bilateral relationship is in very good shape. As I said in Canberra yesterday, uh, because our relationship is in good shape, we must also not take it for granted. We need to always be looking at ways to add new dimensions to this relationship, to making sure that we continue to build bridges among the generation gap and we keep it relevant to the changing environments, both here in Papua New Guinea and also in Australia and other Asia Pacific region. I am hopeful that we can negotiate a very significant change in the way Australia's development assistance to Papua New Guinea is developed and implemented. I want to see the aid program that will strengthen the bilateral relationship and to be widely supported by the Australian community and widely appreciated by my own country. As our government moves to significantly lift spending on key community services, services that will improve living standards and opportunities for our people, we are, such as education and training, health care, and the es essential infrastructure we need to, and to build on the opportunities that are for our country and our people to participate in a growing economy. We would like to see Australian development assistance to closely align itself with our priorities that we have set out. In general, my view is that we are best served and Australia is best served by your aid supporting and strengthening our own priorities, such as rebuilding our major highways, expanding the roads and services to our rural majority. Only yesterday, the day before yesterday, we, we ended past our budget, where we have now prioritized on spending on key medium term social and human development priorities particularly on health, education, law and order, by increasing about 50% of our expenditure in that area in just one year, from a 5 billion amount per year to 7.5 billion next year. The budget also indicated and committed very strongly to increase in the spending of about 12 billion over the next five years for building the infrastructure that the country requires. That will enable us to repair the rundown roads, the seaports and airports, and build new infrastructure we need if we are going to increase the growth of our economy, improve on the agricultural production, and maximizing our development of our vast resources in the mining and gas sector. I hope we can discuss with our Australian counterparts how we can make sure that the generous development assistance program that Australia provides aligns itself and adds on to our priorities. As I said, I want the aid program to have a two-way benefit. I want it to head to our own key programs, programs we are now finding ourselves over the medium term, not just the short term, and I want to also be widely supported by the Australian community and for it to be constructive contribution to making sure that we secure our future. A stable Papua New Guinea is in the best interest of Australia's national interest as well. Our relationship is, again, as I said, is in good shape. We have strongly supported the Australia's successful bid for a seat at the United Nations Security Council. We work together to address regional issues such as the return of democracy in Fiji. We engage constructively in forums such as APEC, where we share the membership. But we are an independent nation. We differ from time to time, but that is healthy 
and it shouldn't be a surprise. In. One final comment I wish to make about our relationship again is that we must never take it for granted. Now this brings me to the central theme of our speech, my speech today, that is Papua New Guinea in the new Asian century. The Australian government recently released a comprehensive white paper titled Australia in the Asian Century. Interestingly, it, it made no mention of Papua New Guinea, although we are very close neighbors and the, the closest neighbor you've got. Even though Australia, like Australia, we are by way of geography a Pacific Island nation, increasingly we are being drawn towards Asia just as Australia and New Zealand is. For Papua New Guinea, our proximity to Asia and our strong and growing relation with countries of the region mean that we are very well placed to benefit widely from the growth occurring in the Asian region. The opportunities for Papua New Guinea clearly differ significantly from Australia can take advantage of. Australia is very well placed to benefit for, from the growth of the middle class in the region, especially China, in the areas such as tertiary education, professional services, and so on. For Papua New Guinea, I see the opportunity as being the extension of our relationship with the region, more so in trade and investment. But there are also new opportunities that will unfold as sections of our economy continues to develop and we really need to be preparing our businesses and our economy generally for that. As you are very much aware, we will be the major exporter of LNG to the world, particularly to Asia. We have just approved the development of the second LNG project in Papua New Guinea, and there will be further development of our vast gas reserves and oil reserves in the medium term. Clearly, we are placed to help meet the growing demands of energy by the Asian region. But that is not going to be without significant challenges that I will outline in a minute. We are also witnessing a very significant expansion of our mining sector. The Ramu Nickel project will soon be reaching its production next month. It is a significant joint venture between a Chinese company and an Australian entity. Within three or four years, I believe Papua New Guinea will be a, a significantly greater exporter of nickel as well as gold and copper to the Asian region and beyond. So our potential to meet the energy and mineral needs brought by the Asian growth is considerable. In that regard, of course, we will be competitor, competitors to Australia in some ways, but I hope it is a friendly competition. The other real significant opportunity for Asia's growth and our proximity to and our good relations with the growing economies of the region offers Papua New Guinea a very interesting opportunity for food security. Food security is clearly one of the key needs of the Asian region. We are currently making little contribution to meeting that. We are struggling to meet even our own food needs. Papua New Guinea is a nation of 7 million people. 80% of the population live in rural, rural and coastal communities where they engage in subsistence farming or fishing or cash crops for production. We have urbanized, but nowhere to the extent of Australia or the other Asian nations in the region. Sadly, agriculture production is, is most success in decline since independence. Uh, exception of the palm oil industry in our country. But we have the human resources and the natural resources such as land to quickly tend that around. We can lift farm production and align our production with the food, the food security needs of the Asian region. We can also develop our vast maritime resources in a sustain sustainable way to help meet the food needs of Asian region, North America and Europe. Helping to meet both the energy needs and the food needs of uh, the region, I believe strongly that Papua New Guinea has a very unique opportunity. And the opportunity, opportunity that I, I believe uh, I want to assure you that we will not pass up. That brings me to the perhaps the greatest challenge that we face as a nation in focusing on these opportunities that Asian century offers. 
Papua New Guinea has never really focused on productivity and especially on government measures to improve productivity. We have been able to export our production to, with relative certainty under agreements we have with the developing countries and with the European Union in particular. We have also had stabilization funds that amounts to a subsidy for our farm sector in times of low world commodity prices. We have been able to export the total quantum of our gold and copper production and our oil and gas production with little ability to negotiate to secure uh, long-term contracts. And this is largely due to the fact that many of the companies that are developing these resources were able to negotiate uh, long-term contracts on our behalf. We have been what Australians might call relaxed and too comfortable when it comes to exporting our minerals and other resources such as forestry. Some may argue that we have been too complacent. What brought this uh, matter really home to me was the revelation by the developers of our first LNG project, where cost blowouts has been in the billions of Kina, uh, with our partners ExxonMobil and oil sets. While currency fluctuations have been a major factor in that, there is no doubt that the actual construction cost has risen significantly. As a shareholder of that project, the national government will meet its share of the additional cost. But what concerns me most is that we have, been take, we, we have taken our eye off the main game when it comes to lifting productivity and addressing the rising cost factors impacting on the development sector of our resource, resources. I believe that our resources sector, investors and developers have done so, so much as the government can do, as well as we are now paying the price for that cost es escalating. Papua New Guinea is now entering a, 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 a very exciting period, exciting period where our GDP is projected to double by 2016. We have an average annual growth of the economy of well over 9.2 percent. But much of our LNG will be now exported to growing economies of Asia, notably China. But we will be exporting to Japan and Korea, amongst other countries in the region. Our challenge is going to be the export of gas from our first project. All the contracts on this project has been finalized. The second challenge is for our second LNG project, currently managed by Intel. Finding markets for that will have uh, numerous difficulties, but of course we are, as government, supporting that project to achieve uh, its, its targeted uh, uh, production. We are also uh, in the process of approving more than 70 applications for, uh, for prospecting licenses in some of the domestic uh, gas and gas uh, industry. We are going to compete with other countries such as Australia, United States, Mal uh, Malaysia and countries in the Middle East on an increasingly crowded LNG market. That is going to require project developers and the national government to focus on cutting development costs uh, streamlining processes, making sure that our uh, tax regime is competitive and stable and ensuring that there is no disruption during construction period. Much of the future demand for LNG and for our mineral resources is going to come from Asia. We cannot expect nations importing LNG and minerals or any other products for that matter give us a favored treatment. We will have to compete and compete in an increasingly competitive international environment. There is no question that the Asian century offers tremendous opportunities for Papua New Guinea. It has done so already. Asia's sustained growth and the thirst for energy in particular is underpinning the contracts of our LNG projects. It is also benefiting our mining sector and our forestry and fisheries. The question is, how do we build on that? How do we maximize the opportunities and maximize returns for our people and our country? The budget that we have brought down last week makes a massive investment in two key sectors. As I have outlined, 50% of our expenditure increases in the spending on health and education and law and order. This will help lift living standards. It will expand the ability of our people to be better educated better skills play a role in the growing and diversifying economy. 
It will also help to maintain social cohesion and community and national harmony. The second major increase and in the lift in spending is in infrastructure. As I said, we have committed extra 12 billion. And in terms, let me put it in this contents. Over the next five years, we will spend the entire budget of Papua New Guinea in developing infrastructure. It is a massive commitment, one that has never been done in the history of our country. Why are we making such a commitment to uh, what sort of achievements are we going to achieve by all these commitments? Firstly, rebuilding roads and highways and building new roads and making new ports will provide more efficiency, make it more accessible for our rural and coastal communities to markets that are not available to them at present. One of the reasons why agricultural production has, has been in decline and why our producers have seen the income fall in real terms is the state of our poor roads and poor ports. As a result, many of our citizens have given up in agricultural production, simply not growing enough food to export or to sell in markets, only enough for the provision for the needs of their own families. By making such a massive commitments to roads in particular, we will help farmers grow more and grow and market it more efficiently and target in the Asian market in particular. This will lift productivity. The second reason why we are making massive investment in infrastructure is to grow our resource sector and give maximum possible benefits so that we can take advantage of the growth in Asia. One of the factors that contributed to the blowout of the first LNG construction is because of the poor state of our infrastructure, particularly the Highlands Highway. You simply cannot grow an economy in a first-rate way with a third-rate infrastructure. That is why we are trying to invest in infrastructure as one of our key priorities. We will be making contribution to improving competitiveness in our resource sector by providing that infrastructure. By investing in people, we are laying the foundation of higher living standards and greater opportunity for people to participate in the economy by investing in these projects and helping and making sure that we remain competitive within the region. So those are the first contributions our government is committed to making so our nation can take advantage of the Asian century. As I have stressed today, we cannot expect a free ride and we won't get one. If we are to supply energy, food, energy and food and other needs for the Asian region in particular, we must lift our productivity and reliability. I am confident that the national government, our investors, our business community, are going to live up to the challenge. We will make sure we work together in achieving that. This brings me to the final point I would like to make today. Our engagement with the Asian region predates our independence. But since independence, it has been priority of every prime minister of our country to try and engage with the Asian community. We share a common land border with Indonesia. So our relationships with Indonesia has always been a highest priority. They are based on mutual trust and respect. We respect Indonesia, Indonesia's territorial integrity and <coughs> Indonesia respects ours. We have strong relationship with Singapore and Malaysia founded on trade and investment and good people to people link. Our relationship with Philippines are also strong, dates back to independence. Japan has been a major trading partner and investment partner. We have bene benefited from many concessional loans and grants, and uh, it has a strong presence in our economy, including the LNG sector. We also have very good links with South Korea, again through trade and investment. But our fastest growing relationship is with the People's Republic of China. People's Republic of China today is, a second, is destined to become the second major trading partner other than Australia, and it is a growing one. There is also a, a bigger increase in investment by China in our resource sector and in our construction sector. As I said, next month, Ramu Nikol, a partnership between an Australian company and a Chinese company, will now take full production next month. We also benefit from donor and concessional funding from China, and I make no apology for encouraging that. 
We are negotiating substantial concessional loans at present. One of the beneficiaries of that project will be the Highlands, rebuilding of the Highlands Highway and other rundown infrastructures in the country. We have a very strong relationship with China, only based on trade and investment. Uh, we are aware of the competing interests that is coming from uh, uh, our partners, traditional partners, uh, particularly the United States, uh, increased interest in the Pacific region. Uh, we have continued to have build that relationship on security, uh, trust, and investment over many, many years. But we feel that uh, the, the security issues that has been expressed by many of our partners, traditional partners is, uh, is unnecessary. We are following the same path that Australia and New Zealand are taking by increasing our relationship with China on trade and investment. We are also now developing our links with India and Russia as part of our comprehensive regional and international engagement. Papua New Guinea is enormously well placed to achieving a strong long-term GDP growth. Uh, is sharing that benefit with our people and our communities is of, of priority to our, our development. As I have stated earlier, a stable, uh, developing, growing Papua New Guinea is in the best national interest of Australia. I believe strongly that Papua New Guinea, with a very uh, growing, fastest growing uh, population in the region, it is very important that we all play a role in making sure that we have a stable environment in Papua New Guinea. I, I want, I'm excited to say that we are privileged uh, to be in government at this present, where we can be able to maximize the opportunities that the Asian century is providing to Papua New Guinea. We must also maintain political stability, and we will do so. I want to also inform uh, this uh, honorable gathering that only two days ago, both sides of parliament uh, passed a legislation where we will now have some label first reading of a legislation where we will have stability in the, in the governments for at least an extended period of two and a half years without any threats of instability through a vote of no confidence, where governments can be able to deliver on the programs and priorities they set out for the country. We must deliver investor certainty and competitive taxation regimes that will give confidence to the investors. We must maintain social cohesion and ensure that our people continue to enjoy a higher standard of living, better quality of services, and greater opportunity to participate in a growing economy. And finally, as I have stressed today, we must lift our national and industry productivity, and our government is committed in doing so. Thank you once again for the privilege of addressing the Lowy Institute, and thank you for your continued interest in Papua New Guinea, not only today, but tomorrow as well. Thank you. Thank you, PM, for a very interesting um, beginning to this discussion, if I can put it that way. And uh, you ended on <coughs> the, the, by, I guess, describing a strategic triangle, if you like, that is formed between the United States and China and Papua New Guinea. Um, and many of, many of the countries in our part of the world are seeing this strategic triangle. It's changing the diplomatic geometry of the region, China's rise, our ties to China are thickening um, just as our ties persist with the United States. And it's of course, as you say, it's not just China, it's also India and Indonesia and Japan and, and other countries you mentioned. Can I ask you, uh, can I, uh, the, the PM has agreed to take some questions and I will take the Chair's prerogative and ask the first one if I can, PM, and ask you what all this means for the Australia PNG relationship. Um, as I said, we had this terrific uh, event in Port Moresby um, and one of the interesting conclusions was that a lot of the young Papua New Guineans were interested in Papua New Guinea. I, won't, I don't know about pivoting away from Australia towards Asia, but they were very interested in Asia and seizing the Asian opportunities. Um, and we have a very strong relationship and you've counselled us not to take it for granted. But at the same time, um, Asian countries are very interested in investing in Papua New Guinea. The Asian development experience in some ways is relevant to Papua New Guinea. So I guess my question to you is, do you think the next generation of PNG leaders will be looking north or west 
more than they look south. Uh, thank you, thank you, Michael. And uh, let me uh, assure assure you and and the rest of the Australian communities that Papua New Guinea's uh, uh, gener generational change in leadership has taken place, and uh, the new leadership of our country uh, it continues to respect the relationship that uh, that we have forged with Australia for many many years. We, we understand that that can never be replaced by any other country or any other, uh, uh, any other person in, in, in the region. Uh, we continue to, to appreciate the assistance that we continue to re receive from Australia. But as Australia, we must develop our economy to sustain itself and provide opportunities for our people. Uh, as Australia is uh, looking towards China and India and other people in the region to also develop their resource sector, we are doing the same thing. We have no strategic relationship with China or anyone else on defense and security. We have that arrangement with China, uh, with the United States and Australia only, and we will continue to maintain the traditional arrangements. But for the economic opportunities, Australia continues to become our biggest investor. Uh, many of the resource development that is taking place in Papua New Guinea is owned by Australian companies, and we are exporting to the same markets. So it is a competition that is very friendly, and I hope that uh, we will continue to maintain that uh, relationship in the, in the future. But I have no doubt whatsoever that uh, the relationship with uh, Australia and Papua New Guinea will continue to grow. In fact, uh, we are encouraging. Uh, one of the examples is about trying to re-engage Australians back into Papua New Guinea uh, in the employment sector, in health and education. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, on. On, on record more than about uh, 15,000 Australians now working and living in Papua New Guinea. They call that as a, as, a, as a home. And we are now trying to expand those numbers by encouraging Australians, uh, particularly in education, as I said, where we are trying to encourage English as a subject of uh, a compulsory subject in schools throughout the country, uh, rather than the young Pap Australians taking a gap year and going to Europe. Hopefully they'll come to Papua New Guinea and go to some school and teach, uh, teach English as a, uh, an opportunity for a year or so. So those are sort of initiatives that we are taking now, lifting the band on foreign employment uh, in some of those uh, areas so that we give uh, an opportunity so our people-to-people -people relationship can, uh, can be built and strengthened further. Thank you, PM. Uh, questions from the floor? One gentleman over here and then at the front. If you could wait until the microphone comes and if you could say your name before you ask your question. Uh, Keith Jackson, <coughs> Mr. Strainer. Um, this really compliments Michael's question about looking south and west and north. This is about looking east. I'm wondering what uh, role you see in the future for the Melanesian Spearhead Group and whether this might be some indication of uh, greater unification between the states of Melanesia. Uh, thank you, uh, Keith, and uh, thank you, uh, Keith. I do en enjoy uh, reading your, uh, your social uh, media network and your comments on our country, and thank you again for all the support that you've extended to us. Uh, but I want to assure you that uh, Papua New Guinea is uh, now starting to take a, a leading role in the Pacific, not only in the Melanesian spirit group, but uh, across the uh, Pacific as a well. whole. Uh, we feel that we have a role to play. Uh, we find that uh, we have uh, uh, an increasing growth in the, our economy uh, that cannot sustain itself without the skilled labour force. And uh, we understand that apart from Australia, many countries like Fiji and Tonga and Samoa have got very good skilled workforce. So we are in the process of lifting up our, our work restriction uh, uh, legislation to allow Pacific Islanders to come in and work in Papua New Guinea without visas. Uh, and, uh, and on our visa work permit visas that are that are expected of them. So increasingly, we are in, uh, also uh, encouraging trade and investment in those areas. Uh, I, I was just uh, advising uh, uh, Michael and uh, Stephanie that uh, we are uh, investing quite a substantial investment in Solomon Islands, in Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. So uh, Papua New Guinea will continue to play an increasing role in the in the Pacific uh, region. Also, uh, uh, last week we hosted a, uh, uh, hosted a meeting of the Pacific ACP uh, uh, Nations uh, meeting, where uh, 14 leaders of the uh, Pacific region uh, were hosted in Port Mosby, where we discussed uh, about re-engagement with Fiji. So Papua New Guinea is taking a leadership role in that because we believe strongly that we must stay engaged with Fiji so that they commit, uh, continue to commit themselves to the time frame that they have set 
where they will go to the elections in uh, two th September 2014. Uh, I, I know very well that the Pacific way of uh, doing things is that if you do not engage continuously with them, uh, of course, they change their minds along the way. So uh, uh, we, we're trying, trying to have that sort of uh, approach being discouraged. And uh, I'm pleased to say that, uh, uh, pleased to note that uh, Australian and New Zealand government are now re-engaging it in official level, and that is very encouraging. We all must work together in making sure that Fiji stays on target so that a democratically elected government can be in place by 2014. Thank you, PM. Um, Prime Minister Han Sherry from Carnival Australia. Um, thank you again for coming. Uh, I'm interested in the role tourism <coughs> might play, uh, both in terms of Papua New Guinea facing Asia, but obviously with Australia as well. And uh, the infrastructure you're putting in place obviously is of interest to me as well as I bring ships to PNG. But the, uh, the opportunity to increase person-to-person -person engagement and also to get benefits to perhaps more remote regions where there's not so much mineral wealth or, uh, or gas wealth. Could you talk a little about that and the sort of thinking the government has uh, uh, in that sphere? Thank you. Uh, thank you once again. It is a pleasure meeting you in Port Mosby and I'm, I'm pleased to see the advertisements of uh, uh, the ships uh, coming into PNG once again. Uh, thank you for helping us build our tourism uh, potential in our country. PNG has got a huge uh, tourism uh, market uh, that we can, uh, opportunity that we can develop. Unfortunately, some uh, level of bad publicity has, has uh, been uh, undermining that, uh, that uh, particular industry. So as I stated in the, uh, at the National Press Club yesterday, uh, some of the commentaries that people have made are, are unwarranted. Uh, they have fairly limited knowledge of what is happening in Papua New Guinea. But for a country as diverse as ours, well, well over a thousand different tribes, uh, seven, eight hundred different languages, uh, a very uh, mixed eth ethnic groupings, uh, we were we are able to all a very democratic country together uh, for 37 years as an independent nation. Uh, no other country in the world has got such diversity, so we are able to do so. So at the same time, we've got a lot of cultural uh, uh, opportunities that uh, our people can develop so that the tourism market uh, becomes more mature. Our government is uh, interested in, uh, in developing that. We are now providing uh, tax incentives for uh, companies to operate in remote areas where uh, tourism is in potential. We are also building infrastructure in many of those areas, improving on the ports and the facilities that uh, large ships can come in and dock. And we are improving on the migration and uh, immigration uh, uh, officials to be present in those areas so it makes it easier for clearance of the tourists. So our, our, our government is committed. We, we know the potential of tourism. It's capable of employing thousands of our people. And uh, we, are, we are certainly focused on that. And I want to assure you that uh, we will give it our, our best in making sure that we facilitate for you. Thank you. I call on Jenny Hayward-Jones, who's the director of the Maya Melanesia program here at the Institute. Thanks, Prime Minister. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the United States. Um, the Asia-Pacific pivot of the Obama administration has been interpreted in many ways in many countries um, throughout the Asia-Pacific. And the focus tends to be more on Asia, but there is definitely a Pacific part of that that has been acknowledged by the administration. I was wondering how you see Papua New Guinea capitalising on that interest, um, particularly in, in light of the Exxon investment and perhaps building on that. Um, and, and secondly, you've, you've mentioned that you have substantial interest from Asia. Do you perceive that there's a balancing act required um, to manage the interest from both the US and increasingly yeah. from China and the Asian yeah. Our relationship with, uh, apart from, with United States, uh, apart from trade and investment, is uh, also on, in security. We, we, we understand that we have a historical link, uh, especially uh, after the Second World War. Uh, we, maintain, we, we maintain that relationship. Uh, but with China, as I've stated, we have no security arrangements. We are engaged, engaging with them like everyone else in the world, trade and investment. Uh, we also have a huge uh, appreciation of the United States and Australian government. In the national accounts, they have made a substantial investment each government has ever made in their history. Uh, United States provided well over three billion U.S. dollars on their national account to invest in the uh, LNG project in Papua New Guinea. Australian government over uh, 500 million dollars for that particular project also. This is uh, the highest that each government has ever invested in any country. So we appreciate the commitments 
that they are making in trade to our country. Uh, but uh, as, as we said, we appreciate that, but uh, we must also on our own develop our trade relations with the others in the region, and that is precisely what we are doing. I mean, the PM makes a good point about Australia also turning towards Asia. I had an American, um, a conversation with an American friend a week ago, and he told me that, that uh, some people in Washington, including in the administration, were perturbed by uh, the idea of the Asian century white paper in Australia turning to Asia. I said, but President Obama is pivoting to Asia, so, you know, what, what do you expect? And he said, yes, but, but we thought you'd pivot more to us as we pivot to Asia. So I guess we're all watching each other, PM, to, to see which direction we go. Um, there was a gentleman in the middle who caught my eye earlier. Thank you. Patrick Lindsay, the Prime Minister, where do you see the NGO's role in your new approach to trying to, to move um, Australian aid into the areas you think are most important in PNG? Uh, thank you, thank you, Patrick, and thank you again for the invitation uh, to the Kokoda Foundation dinner here in Sydney uh, not so long ago. Uh, I understand the work Kokoda Track and other uh, foundations in, in our country and uh, NGOs are doing. We appreciate that. Uh, our government is trying to work with them, but we must work together in priorities that the government is setting out, uh, rather than working individually and having parallel uh, schemes where it will be too costly and we are spending limited resources uh, without proper planning and, and, and priority. So government's uh, a commitment uh, to foundations like yours is that we will work together, we will help uh, where you can deliver best, we will help fund it so that uh, you can use our resources also to deliver in the service that you are doing. Uh, we are pleased with the work that Kokoda Track is doing, uh, foundation is doing on the, on the track, where they are attending to schools and health facilities along the track. Uh, our government has already made a commitment to, to assist you to fund it because we believe that your foundation is in a better place to deliver them than, than government can. Likewise, we are doing similar arrangements with the other NGOs. Uh, this year, we have also increased the uh, ability for us to work with the churches throughout the country. Uh, for the first time, we are funding direct uh, funding to the health and education programs in the churches. Uh, well over 100 million kina for, for those. So. Uh, government is fully committed in making sure that we lift the standards of both education, health and other services that uh, government cannot provide in, in some areas of our country. There's a lady down there on the, on the edge. Yes. My name is Briggs I'm a continuity planner. I've been working with the AG for various organizations. Um, one of the most limiting factors I hear from people actually including my own um, work there is the uh, safety um, of uh, Port Moresby. Um, it may lead to the, the question of the lady about tourism. I don't know what you're referring to with that so publicity and all that. Um, to what degree is that part of your strategic plan to address that or how will that be addressed? Uh, thank you. That is a very, very important uh, question because uh, our government's one of the uh, priorities, we, we focus on three or five areas. One is to uh, make sure that health and education standards are lifted in the country. We are focusing on improving health and making sure that rather than funding all the hospitals, we will continue to fund them with drugs and provision of medical staff and so forth. But rebuilding the infrastructure, we're trying to build one and making sure that that runs properly. So we're starting with the biggest one in Port Mosby, that is Port Mosby General Hospital, where it serves over a million people every year. Uh, so the approach that we are doing now is to try and making sure that uh, we rebuild some of the infrastructures. On law and order particularly, despite uh, the 11 years of continuous growth, over the last 10 years, we have not recruited one new single policeman, we have not recruited one new, we have not trained one new policeman. Only last year, when we in 2011, when we got into government, we had a, we invested heavily into rebuilding what we call the uh, Bomana Police uh, Training College, uh, with the assistance of the Australian OSE program, uh, and we invested into getting the first 200 policemen graduating from that particular training. Now we are increasing that to almost triple that every year. So uh, we are now building the second training facility down in Leigh and uh, improving on the facilities in Port Mosby to increase the numbers. So by within 2000, by 2017, we are hoping to put at least another two to 3,000 policemen on the street. 
So when you have an increase in population and you have a, a, a ratio of population of uh, three or four thousand to one policeman, it's no wonder you cannot control the uh, law and order issues in the country. So we are investing not only in training on uh, on the on the policemen, but we are encouraging through our, the aid program and, uh, and and funding with the Australian government and other development partners, getting some of our policemen to 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 uh, be seconded to other parts of the world where they can learn better discipline and ethical way of uh, uh, conducting themselves when they return. So we are talking to the Commonwealth uh, nations who have similar jurisdiction as ours to get more training and more of the more of the uh, officers to go out there to manage a police force. So hopefully over the next two or three years we can see a, a, an increase in the, the number of policemen on the ground. At the same time we are now this year putting extended amount of funding into the defense force because uh, we are now u utilizing the defense force also to now maintain law and order in the country. I'll give you an example that we had to, during the elections, we had to call out the defense force to go and provide security. As a result, the elections was trouble free. Uh, so uh, we also called them out to go and provide security on the LNG project, where landowners were continuously uh, uh, disrupting uh, the, the uh, work that was going on. Uh, so those things are now happening and I think a law and order situation will improve uh, dramatically over the next few years. And uh, Port Mosby will, is going to have, uh, be the estimated to become the fifth largest city within the region. Apart from Sydney and uh, Melbourne and Auckland and Brisbane, uh, Port Mosby will be the, uh, the next with a population of over a million people by 2020. So uh, with that kind of pressure, we need to make sure that we have a highly trained uh, law and order agencies that will maintain law and order within, within those communities. Yeah, the lady in the red top. I was still thinking about the increase um, in investment in health really. and I was just wondering if that would include specific medical and psychological support for victims of sexual and family based violence in the hospitals that we work throughout the beginning that's a real um, need and some of the steps to this. Yes, thank you. And uh, of course, uh, domestic violence and, uh, uh, is an issue. You know, Papua New Guinea is a very traditional society still. And unfortunately, uh, these things are happening more frequently than, uh, than what, we, what we want. But government is concerned about that. We are strengthening the laws to making sure that we punish those who are, who are uh, causing those offences. And at the same time, the support that we are trying to provide through community development. Uh, unfortunately, the community development has been in battle in a court case between the leadership uh, of the department itself, uh, which is frustrating the work that we are trying to do. But once that is sorted out, we have uh, put considerable amount of funding in through the community development program, and I'm hoping that uh, they will work with uh, some of the uh, uh, NGOs, particularly uh, uh, those like uh, Aus Ruth, which provides uh, psychological support for uh, victims of the, the, the violence, uh, uh, we hope that uh, we will expand that across the country, but for the first time in many, many years, we have got a health plan, a 10-year health plan, which has been fully costed now, where we are now spending an average of 1.4 billion kina every year, which is almost 20% of the uh, entire budget of the country. So we are making substantial investments into the health sector, and I'm hoping that we will make a real difference uh, in, in that. I know, uh, in fact, uh, my wife is a patron of one of those organizations and we are uh, pushing for more investment in that area and government is committed in doing so. We have time for a couple more questions. There was a gentleman right behind the lady who just asked the question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Frank Wolmer from the National Newspaper. I'm Minister Sam Kerr, uh, Minister of Australia and Papua New Guinea and others do North and West uh, for uh, business and investment, there's a steady south of flow of uh, ACS populations facing uh, pressure on uh, uh, governments, including uh, Australia and our own, and uh, leading to, to the controversial establishment of uh, 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 seven central numbers. Beyond uh, establishing uh, asylum centers, Idea talks with Australia and New Zealand and others is there a bigger plan to stand the steady flow with basic pressure on, 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 on our 
I know the uh, asylum seeker issue is an oddly uh, debated item here in Australia, and, and of course uh, it, it is uh, similarly debated in my own country. Uh, we have uh, allowed Australia to establish the asylum seekers uh, processing centre in Manus uh, because of the uh, commitments we have made earlier. Uh, the former government uh, signed an agreement with uh, the Australian government then to, to allow the Australian government to, to establish that centre. Uh, we simply had to honour that commitment. Uh, and we support that it is not only the issue for Australian, Australian government and the Australian people to, to handle. We have similarly illegal immigrants coming into our country, and my uh, condition to the Australian government was that we establish a permanent processing centre for all illegal immigrants coming through the region, uh, not only in Papua New Guinea but other countries, smaller countries, who do not have the capacity to manage their borders and manage their uh, uh, immigration issues uh, within those small island countries. So uh, uh, Australian government has agreed to that. Uh, in fact, uh, we are now uh, looking for a permanent spot in Manus Island where we will establish a uh, permanent processing centre uh, and hopefully we will develop that into a regional processing centre in the coming years. Take one more question, the gentleman over there. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Dave Rose from the Royal United Observatories Institute of New South Wales. Uh, you've mentioned uh, your uh, plans for trade, and of course, the sort of trade you're mentioning are really deliberately leads us into maritime activities, and that uh, leads us into ports and port security. Any thoughts or much work being done on ports and maritime security around PNG? Because they are very important once you get into LNG and mineral export. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, increasing our presence of security on the ports, uh, including uh, bringing in new equipment that will scan the uh, the, uh, the uh, containers uh, that are coming into the two main ports, especially we're starting with Port Mosby and Leh. Uh, in Leh, we have expanded the port uh, facilities. We've just invested close to 700 million kina in expanding that facility in view of the uh, increase in trade. Uh, and also because of the increase in the volume of uh, traffic between between those uh, those, those two ports, we are in increasing those investments. Uh, we are looking at a new port development in Port Mosby, relocating the one we have because uh, of capacity issues. Uh, but security has been improved in all ports throughout the country, and uh, we are now trying to trying to get marine time and uh, immigration people to also be present at the around the port facilities so we can strengthen uh, the work, uh, work of port management in our country. All right, Prime Minister. Um, Prime Minister, can I thank you very much for your speech. Uh, you were very interested, we're very grateful, not only that you came, but that you consented to continue the conversation here at the Institute on the Asian century and what it means for all of us. You have very interesting things to say on that, um, but my mind will keeps going back to the comment you made at the beginning on Australia's relationship with PNG, that it's in good shape, but that we shouldn't take it for granted. We at the Institute don't take it for granted. We continue to, to work on it and to contribute to it. Um, and I know you do too. And I was particularly struck by that little example of trying to encourage more Australians, instead of taking their gap year uh, in the flesh pots of London, going to, Pop <laughs> going to Papua New Guinea and teaching for a year and getting to know a country that's very close to us and very important to us. So we might tweet, tweet that from the Lowy Institute account in the next day or two to see if we can um, stir up a bit of interest. So uh, thank you, PM, very much for coming. And can I ask everybody to thank the Honourable Peter o